Good morning and welcome to this morning's uh, Signposts uh, webinar. I hope we find you well wherever you are on this unusually crisp and frosty morning, certainly here in the southeast. Uh, the Signpost series is brought to you in, in conjunction with Dairy Sustainability Ireland, uh, Food Drink Ireland Skillnet and the National Rural Network. Uh, this morning, we are delighted to, to be joined uh, by uh, Dahi Keelhan from UCD, a postdoc researcher from UCD. Dahi, if you take off your, your mute. And also by, by Dominika Kroll, who's a researcher in, in Chagas Johnstown Castle on gaseous emissions uh, uh, research. Uh, Dahi and, and uh, Dominika, you're very welcome. Thank you so much for having me. everyone. Thank you for Good having morning, everyone. Uh, we're also joined by uh, Parik Foley uh, to help with the questions later on. So know. this morning's uh, topic is uh, on. Uh, uh, reducing uh, the emissions from uh, ammonia uh, and and uh, trajectories for ammonia emissions. Uh, Dahi, I think you're up first if you want to yep. share your presentation. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so we'll start off with what is ammonia. It's a compound of nitrogen, hydrogen, formula of NH2. So for every one nitrogen molecule, there's three hydrogen um, molecules. It's colorless gas, it's characteristic pungent smell. You might not realize you know what it smells like, but if you ever driven by, you know, story spreading or a pig house, you, you have certainly caught a whiff of ammonia in, in that smell. It has a short residency time in the atmosphere. It readily reacts with other chemicals to form particulate matter. And um, so ammonia itself is a problem locally and there's high, usually a high local deposition and, and impacts rising from that. But then it's the particulate matter which is formed to the atmospheric chemical reactions that can actually be transported several kilometers away and is a problem much further away. Um, and it, it, it it, in combination from both the local ammonia and the particulate matter, there's impacts on both the environment and human health. So where does ammonia come from? Um, in Ireland, 99% comes from agriculture. Across Europe, then that actually decreases a little bit because there's other non-agricultural sources. In and around 6.7% comes from non-agriculture, so things like biomass burning, a little bit from traffic as well. Uh, about 43.5% of emissions across Europe comes from fertilizers, so that's a combination of inorganic, synthetic, um, and organic, that's animal manure, um, whereas 28.3% comes from cattle, and 18.2% from pig and poultry. So that's really coming from the manure management of these animals, and how the um, emissions come from the, the combination of slurry and um, urine coming from them, and uh, various manures, etc. But then there's you know, contributions from... Um, other animals, you know, sheep, goats, and horses contribute a small percentage, 2.9%, but they're the real heavy hitters in terms of emissions across Europe. So, I mean, unlike greenhouse gases, I know we talk about emissions and um, uh, contributions to national ceilings, etc. So, where greenhouse gases are contributing towards international problems, ammonia is different because it really contributes to local problems, and it's a problem locally. So, usually where you have high emissions, you will have high um, impacts locally because it contributes to direct impacts on the local environment so something like carbon trading where you can trade between countries isn't really possible because the impact is occurring where the emissions are higher so it's really down to where the emissions are occurring and what sensitive habitats or what habitats are downwind of where the emissions are are occurring and again when, once you follow the chemical the pathway of ammonia after it's been emitted and its chemical transformation and things like particulate uh, particulate matter is contributes to total nitrogen deposition much further away and also the human health impacts um, much further away. It actually is a substantial contribution to um, particulate matter, and even, even in urban areas, which we'll talk a little bit more in a while. So on the right, I've just got two pictures in the bottom. You can see that's sphagnum moss on a, um, a bog, which has been impacted by ammonia. It's starting to decay, it's all slimy. And then similarly on a tree on, on a bog, you can see all this green algae is starting to appear, which is again, another indicator I'll talk a little bit more about in a while. So, as to summarize that slide, it's essentially, unlike greenhouse, gas, um, greenhouse gases, it's a problem locally, so it should be dealt with locally, and it, um, something like carbon trading isn't really possible. So in terms of what actually impacts on the ground e ecologically, um, how do you define what an impact is? These are done by two mechanisms, which are critical levels and critical loads. And what they are essentially is a critical level is a threshold, so contribution of ammonia in the atmosphere. So 
concentration of ammonia gas in the air that will cause an impact. Whereas a critical load is how much nitrogen is being deposited on the ground, which, is called, which will cause an impact primarily through eutrophication. So the concentrations of which you would get an impact from, i.e. a critical, critical level, are one in three micrograms per meter cube, which are relatively you know, low concentrations, um, difficult enough to detect in the air without, with, um, without using equipment like passive samplers, for example. So the critical loads are a little bit more complex as they incorporate all other forms of reactive nitrogen being deposited including wet and dry. So the difference between wet and dry deposition is wet deposition is when ammonia is pulled out through the rain and deposited in the ground, whereas dry deposition is through the you know, likes of plant surfaces. So it's direct contact with the air and a plant surface. So the more plant surface you have, the more ammonia will be deposited um, on the ground. And they're based on you know, a 30 year average because they're really intended to look at long-term impacts and changes across these communities. However, the currently used crit empirical critical loads may be too high to actually protect ecology in Ireland because recent work that, being led by University of Trent in Canada has really showed that you get species community change points at deposition rates much lower than the empirical critical loads. And on the right, I have a table here with just some example habitat. So for the different heatlands, you know, you've got empirical critical loads of 10 to 15 and 10 to 20 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. But on the ground, what you're actually seeing is you get impacts much lower at around 4.9 and 4.1 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. So really the habitat is being impacted when the species community changes rather than when the, um, the 10 to 15 um, kilograms is being deposited on the site. And going in a little bit more detail for the semi-natural dry grasslands, I've got the slide up here, or the image up here on the top is actually, that's the data that's being used to derive these community change points. So each black line is a nitrogen sensitive species and each red line is a nitrogen tolerant species. So you can see as the deposition increases along the bottom, so from six to 10 to 12 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare, nitrogen per, hectare per year, you start to see sensitive species are dropping off and tolerant species are increasing. So the species community change point is here right around, right around 8.3, but you've actually already lost some nitrogen sensitive species by the time you get to that point. So even at around six, kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year, even below the vegetation community change points, you're lose, starting to lose species. So impacts are, um, they're, look, they're complicated and there is work ongoing on them. And there's you know, upcoming meetings that will define future empirical critical loads based on this um, accumulated research because this research is occurring across Europe and you know, the, um, the world too, because a lot of work has been done in the US on this recently as well. So it's looking likely that you know, these critical loads will drop to reflect the, the fact that these impacts are occurring at much lower deposition rates than previously thought. Now, what happens when these deposition rates are exceeded and you know, these concentrations are exceeded? And um, so the impacts are coming from direct toxicity of ammonia, from the eutrophication as reactive nitrogen. So it's adding more nutrients to a habitat than it's evolved to be able to withstand. And then, you know, there's factors like acidification of the deposited nitrogen as well, which isn't as important as the toxicity and eutrophication, but it's still part of the picture. So what this will result in is, you know, impacts on sensitive species. So as I mentioned earlier, sphagnums are hugely important for bogs. Without sphagnum, you don't have a bog. So the picture on the right here is a colleague of mine. She's holding in her hand one hand, and um, you know, the brown slimy stuff that's impacted a sphagnum. And then on the right is, you know, healthy sphagnum. So you won't see that, that sphagnum on sites that aren't being impacted by ammonia because it's contributing to these impacts, which will limit the ability of that site to meet its conservation objectives and it'll impact the site. And it also affects the site's ability to act as a carbon sink as well, reducing the amount of carbon that these peatlands can take in. Um, you also get proliferation of nitrophytic species. These are species that love nitrogen. It's like, you know, algal slimes is a really good one to, to start with because on the bottom right, we can see the tree on the, on the left is, you know, beautifully healthy tree, beautiful epiphytic life in community. On the right, that's in an area that's being impacted with ammonia, thick, nasty algal slimes. Um, so you don't need a doctor to realize that the one on the left is better than the one on the right. And again, these are indicators which are reflecting the impacts that are occurring, but across communities are getting much wider impacts um, affecting the, the entire ecosystem. So essentially, the, the summation of this is that, well, ammonia is a significant threat to conservation of Irish habitats, which is particularly important when we're looking at what we need to protect legally under the European Union Habitats Directive specifically sites within the, within, the, within the Nature 2000 network of designated sites. So no plan or project which allows any impact on these sites can be permitted. So these sites are supposed to be pristine. We're supposed to be doing, Ireland's supposed to be doing, every European member state is supposed to do the best they can to protect these sites. So a number of which are designated for active raised bogs, as I mentioned earlier. 
So theoretically, an insured housing site cannot, shouldn't be able to exceed concentrations that would cause an impact. However, based on the most recently available concentration model, which I'll go talk about a little bit later, there's no mature housing site for active raised bogs, which falls below the threshold for impact, i.e. they're all impacted. There's only two which even have concentrations that fall below the site, so there's Loch Corb and River Moist. They're quite large SACs, and they're the only two that even have a concentration that's below the critical level for these sites. And this, so the gray bars here are actually the average concentration across the site. And then the, the error bar is, so the high is for the maximum. And then the, the bottom error bar is for the minimum. So even on many of these sites, even a minimum concentration does not fall below the, um, the, the critical level for these sites. But it's not just, we're not just relying on modeled data because you, know, you need to monitor, physically monitor, well, how much ammonia is occurring on these natural thousand sites. So I, I was involved in a project where we monitored just 12, 12 sites. And similarly, again, on all raised bogs we monitored, they all exceeded their critical levels and loads for impacts from ammonia and nitrogen deposition. Only two sites fell below the critical level for lichens and mosses, that's for the critical level of one microgram per meter cubed, both of which were upland sites. The second, which was you know the Wicklow Mountains, um, actually exceeded its critical load because of contribution from um, upwind agriculture um, to the uh, wet deposition on the site. So the wet deposition actually not kicked it up above, the, above its critical load, where you're looking at the total nitrogen deposition on the site. Being more, now, where the, are these impacts physically coming from on these sites? It's not just from intensive hotspot source, sources, i.e. You know, pigs and poultry. Um, you also have impacts from passive sources. So one of these sites, Rahimore Bog in County Offaly, we monitored the concentration of 2.3 micrograms per meter cubed. So it's under the three micrograms per meter cubed threshold for higher plants, but above the one for um, designated for more sensitive lichens and mosses, which is what should be applied to raised bogs. So there's no hotspot sources of ammonia nearby. Coast is three kilometers downwind. The only so local sources of ammonia are adjacent dairy farming and slurry spreading. And in addition to exceeding the critical, critical level, there was also numerous ecological indicators of effects on these sites. Again, this algae was proliferating on all the um, header. So the bottom right, as you can see that green algae um, proliferating across the, uh, the uh, Cluna vulgaris. And on the tree here, again, you see there's still the indicators of some nitrogen um, tolerant, sorry, nitrogen sensitive species. I think that's Ramelina on the tree, but they're all being encroached by this algae again, which is coming across the site as a direct result from ammonia and nitrogen deposition. Now it's not just the environment we need to worry about in terms of ammonia because PM 2.5 um, is a substantial um, thing that we need to consider for human health. So this forms from reactions of ammonia in the air with nitrogen dioxide and, and sulfur dioxide primarily, other pollutants as well. So PM 2.5 passes through the lungs and into the bloodstream. And even in cases where you've got, when you're, where you have an extra 10 micrograms per meter cubed of PM2.5 in the air, you have an increase of 1% in hospital admissions. So there's been a lot of work done to tie that, to tie the um, PM2.5 to um, actual real world um, impacts. So it's been often cited that managing ammonia emissions is actually the best route to reduce urban PM2.5 as well, because in Europe, 50%, so that's 50% of urban PM2.5, so that's an area as far away from agriculture, is formed from agricultural ammonia being emitted further away. So where does, like, we need to look at what the emissions are occurring across the country. So there was work done in, by Map Era in the University of Aarhus, which maps the national emissions map for ammonia, how much ammonia is emitted per kilometer squared. A concentration model was developed by UK, UKCEH, UK Center for Ecology and Hydrology and UCD, where what we did is we model how much the ammonia is being emitted and then how the meteorological, how the meteorological information you know, spreads this ammonia across the land and you know, how much is deposited and essentially models the concentration that would occur following the integration of meteorological data onto the emissions. So this will predict the concentrations across the sites. You can use that to calculate your critical level exceedances and then subsequently also work out your um, total nitrogen deposition. And again, look, ammonia is highly seasonally and spatially variable. So concentrations, as I said earlier, is highly dependent on local emissions. Um, so this is actually a video of the concentration model across Ireland. So we can see now we're in January, quite low emission, low concentrations were in around, we're not even hitting one across most of the country yet. But if we fast forward, you know, into 
June, then we start to see, okay, it was much higher. Now we're, we're talking more six to 10 micrograms per meter cubed in areas, you know, we're above 16. And you see these pulses of red as emissions increase during the day, because you're also a diurnally variable as well. So you've got higher emissions during the day than you do during the night. So therefore concentrations are also diurnally variable alongside the um, emissions. And then we fast forward again to, to November, December, they're starting to de decrease again. So essentially, you know, they're highest when warm and lowest when cold. So, but when you're looking at in terms of the impacts, you need to average that across the year because the annual average critical level is what's used to assess contribution to impacts. And then this is for critical loads is actually over 30 years. And just to highlight it again, so the, um, is that the National Emission Ceiling Director, just to point this out quickly, it was originally intended to limit national emissions. So they set national emission ceilings thresholds for each European member state. It's been recently updated. So that now that every European member state also needs to consider, well, what are the impacts of these emissions on sensitive habitats? So each member state needs to set up a national monitoring network to monitor air quality and air quality impacts on sensitive habitats and ecosystems intended to monitor long-term effects of air pollution. So to monitoring things, for example, like you know ammonia concentrations, nitrogen deposition, vegetative community responses, percent um, tissue of nitrogen and mosses, you know, nitrogen content in soils, et cetera. It's a, it's a wide ranging network covering many, many topics. Um, and that's my last slide. Thank you very much for paying attention. I'll pass it on to Dominique Kroll. Thank you. Thanks very much, Di. Uh, really informative. And it's, uh, I, I suppose it, the notion that the impacts are, are, are just really local, uh, uh, where there's a source in terms of the impact on, on habitats, I think you, you kind of blew it out of the water a little bit in, in that, the, I suppose the, the uh, conglomeration or the bringing together of all those local sources make almost everywhere or, or most of the places that we're trying to protect uh, susceptible, yep. regardless of whether there's, there's kind of heavy emitting in, uh, uh, agricultural activity in, in the locality. Yep, very much so. Yeah, int really interesting. Thank you. Dominica. So I'll move on then from those kind of concentrations and impacts of ammonia locally to, you know, as, as Dahi made it very clear, they come from agricultural sources. So I'll go into a little bit more detail of where exactly they come from and what uh, solutions we have um, with regards to, to mitigating those emissions. So first of all, just wanted to show you where we are in regards to emissions. So what Dahi was uh, talking about, a lot of it is concentrations and then leading to critical loads and, um, and nitrogen deposition. It basically all starts with ammonia emissions. The more emissions, the higher concentration. Um, so our ammonia emissions have been stable you know, here you can see from 1990 all the way to maybe around 2010, we've been kind of bouncing up and down a little bit, um, but we were relatively stable. And then you can see that uh, increasing trend coming from starting from around 2011, and we are on the upward trend. So the most recent data that uh, the EPA recorded is 2019, uh, which is a little bit down. So we'll see how that trend um, evolves over time. At the moment, you know, it still kind of looks like it's, uh, it's increasing. Um, so the increasing trend uh, has been so much that actually in the last um, reporting, uh, reporting period, so in the last 10 years between 2010 and 2019, we've actually been non-compliant with the National Emission Ceilings Directive for seven out of the 10 years. So what you see here in the bottom row of that table is our allowable ceiling, so how much ammonia we can emit every year. And all the, um, all the emissions indicated in red are, are where we exceeded our limit, okay? And that's historically. Now, how, that, how, how that's going to look like going forward. Um, according to EPA projections, if we don't, um, if, if we just use our existing mitigation measures, uh, so the top row um, of that table, um, we will be non-compliant in, you know, in the next uh, 10 years, so 2020, 2025, all the way to 2030. And that's because we have our reduction commitments are even more stringent now uh, than between 2010 and 2019. Um, so against the backdrop of more and more reductions being uh, needed 
in ammonia emissions, we're actually going in the opposite direction. Um, now, the second projection that you see here at the bottom here um, is what the EPA projects ammonia emissions will be in the, um, in the following years um, with additional measures. So how those additional measures are modeled, they're basically based on a lot of uh, research that's been done in Chagask and um, incorporated into what's called marginal abatement cost curve, so MAC curve for ammonia. Um, so if we, if we fully adopt measures um, from the ammonia MAC, um, we can actually get uh, compliant with ammonia regulations um, around 2025 and, and still um, be compliant for the rest of the, uh, of the commitment period. So, you know, which is a really good news that uh, there is a pathway to, to compliance there. Um, so what exactly we need to do um, to bring ourselves to compliance? So what I want to do here is bring you through the main sources of ammonia in agriculture and what we've done on those different sources in, with regards to um, research and you know, what uh, ultimately what solutions there are. So if you look at the pie chart here, um, it's actually, well, it is what Dahi said, that majority of ammonia comes from animals and animal manures. Um, so nine, that's 90% in Ireland. Only 10% comes from synthetic fertilizer. Um, and half, half of our uh, ammonia emissions comes from manure management during housing, uh, animal housing and storage of manures. And then the further 30% from land spreading. Okay. And then 12% from grazing, um, which is actually quite an interesting breakdown. If you think about it, our housing period is relatively short. It's only maybe two to four months, depending on the um, or where in the country you are, what the weather is like, soil type, animals. Um, so that short period when the animals are um, are in the house in, in the sheds, and then the resulting slurry storage. That's responsible for half of our ammonia. Okay, whereas our grazing season is extremely long up to around 300 days. Um, and that grazing only contributes 12% of ammonia, okay? So grazing in itself and extending a grazing length is a mitigation measure for ammonia emissions because you know, there is no long manure management chain where that manure is deposited in the house and stored in land spread. And at all these different steps, there can be ammonia emissions associated with it, okay? So I'll start with those kind of largest sources being uh, housing and storage land spreading. So when it comes to ammonia from housing, what you see here is photos from a study from a, a few years ago from one of my colleagues um, that measured ammonia emissions in, um, in animal houses. Um, so the graph here um, indicates uh, emissions from four different buildings, A, B, C, and D, um, and the different bars are associated with different sides of the building. And then the bar at the very end, if I can point that, um, this is the total for the different sides of the building. Um, and what you can see here very clearly from that graph, it's very variable. Okay, so there's a um, there is a large variability in uh, the types of buildings we have, in their architecture, uh, in how they're positioned towards the wind, and uh, how much ammonia they actually emit. Okay, so on that, um, there is also uh, so there is difference between those uh, between those buildings. There is difference between um, as well whether the shed is slatted or for example, straw based on a solid floor. Um, so we know that slatted sheds actually emit more ammonia than, than straw based, uh, than deep bedding. Um, and what I'd like to draw your attention to is what I was saying, it is that large nitrogen loss pathway. Um, so here, um, even if we look at the kind of uh, smaller losses uh, from, the, from, from building B to, uh, to D, um, we're talking at approximately half a kilogram of nitrogen, not even, um, not even ammonia, but pure nitrogen in that ammonia gas every day. So if we're talking about um, a two-month uh, housing period, 
<clears throat> excuse me, that's 30 kilograms of ammonia. If we're talking about four months housing, that's already 60 kilograms. So that's a large loss of nitrogen if you think about it. Um, so that's why that's, you know, that's actually a substantial part of our inventory. So the question around mitigation of those, um, of those losses, well, there's a number of technological solutions for uh, houses such as scrapers, washing of those scraped surfaces, different floor designs such as you know, creating slopes, urine channels so that it can drain, um, separating urine and dung, um, having slat mats and, and plus or might, they, they, they might even have valves um, to further separate um, dung from urine. Um, so there's a, there's a number of things that can be done there technologically. Um, there are some additives that can be added onto floor surface that have been um, tested in smaller scale studies that, that, that looked promising. Um, and the other kind of big thing is actually at the very, very top of that, um, you know, it's, it's nothing to do with, um, with building of the house and, um, and, and with um, any engineering solution. It's actually reducing crude protein content in animal diets. So this is very easy. Basically, less nitrogen coming into the diet, there's less nitrogen coming out the back end. So it means there's less nitrogen in that, uh, in that slurry and that leads to lower emissions, okay? So that's one actually big one and reducing housing length, so ex extended grazing that I've already mentioned kind of at the very beginning. Um, and just to give you an example, one of the studies that, um, that we've done um, in Johnstown, um, one of my colleagues worked on looking at um, scraping and washing yards and, and in general hard surfaces. Um, and there's a huge uh, amount of ammonia that can be saved uh, if those surfaces are cleaned relatively quickly after, um, after deposition. So for example, scrapers working um, inside the shed, um, if, they, if they scrape the surface every uh, three hours, they can reduce ammonia emissions by around 50%. And um, if they scrape every hour, they can reduce ammonia by nearly 80%. So, you know, that's a, that, that, that's a huge reduction there. Um, on the slurry storage side, um, as I said, majority of our um, of our sheds are actually slatted um, slatted houses with uh, slurry storage underneath. So that makes it a bit more difficult because we are limited in what we can do in that in that slurry storage. And um, if there are outdoor tanks, then we can cover them. That's very effective. But if there's slatted sheds with animals above them, there is there is limited um, things that we can do. Um, so in Johnston, we've been working on different slurry additives, looking at um, basically a smaller versions of slurry tanks all the way from kind of very small vessels to kind of larger scale to, to, to those kind of mesoscale scale tanks. Um, when we simulate the, 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 the slurry storage um, and can uh, measure emissions from, from it kind of a, a very controlled and replicated manner. What we've seen so far is that um, this is quite well known internationally um, that acidic amendments um, such as sulfuric acid for chloride, they can reduce ammonia emissions and also methane emissions um, very effectively. Um, but what we've also looked at, there's, there, there's been more work done in Johnstown. Um, we looked at uh, emissions in storage and at land spreading and how those different, um, those different amendments uh, pan out. So while our acidifiers are very uh, effective when it comes to reducing um, emissions in storage, um, what might happen is as we retain more nitrogen in that slurry, uh, we will increase, uh, for example, nitrous oxide emissions after land spreading. Okay. Um, similarly, when we tried different um, a kind of waste stream materials from agriculture and uh, food production. Um, we've seen, you know, some success in reducing uh, ammonia emissions. However, some of them increased methane emissions. So it's not a very easy story to tell. Um, where we tested uh, commercial amendments, here we actually haven't really seen um, any promising results in, in reducing uh, emissions. So 
this isn't maybe an easy message to 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 say and what i you know the the kind of take-home message from this is the nitrogen flows in one way so once the um once the animal uh, excretes the, the nitrogen, uh, it kind of moves from housing, storage, to land spreading, and it can be lost at any of those stages. So when we talk about uh, slurry amendments in storage, we amend here, we can still um, then lose that nitrogen at spreading. So realistically, what we should be targeting is um, either reducing uh, emissions at spreading, because that is that last step of the uh, of the flow um, and also at the first stage so with reducing crude protein okay going in um, so without a kind of spending too much time on it i'll move on to then slurry spreading and what we do know very well is that ammonia emissions uh, occur very quickly and they are weather dependent with you know typically uh, losses being high in the summer okay uh, what we know as well is there is a huge difference between um, um, splash plate and low emission slurry spreading. So we know from previous work in Johnstown um, and internationally, you know, when you're land spreading, when you're just broadcasting your slurry, you can lose up to half of available nitrogen from that slurry and very, very quickly. So that half nitrogen gone. Um, if you move to low emission slurry spreading, you can reduce that uh, loss substantially. It's still quite large, you know, 19%, nearly 20% of available nitrogen. That's still substantial, but it's much better than losing 50%. Okay. And that's kind of that's from previous research. What the um the values that EPA uses, which are obviously averages for the whole country and for um, summer separately, for spring and autumn separately. Um, we assume that there is a 30% reduction in ammonia emissions with a trailing hose, 60% reduction with a trailing shoe, and injection offers a further 10%. So it goes down to 70% um, to uh, reduction. Okay, so they're substantial, but there's actually still a lack of, um, a lack of values kind of locally in Ireland. So more research is still needed, even though this is a, it is widely accepted technology, just to know exactly how much we can reduce emissions. Um, and based on that, that's why we're currently undertaking a, a new project, um, which is, a, you know, that's probably one of the largest scales that we've been working on um, in, um, <clears throat> sorry, In measuring ammonia at kind of sub paddock scales and at very high frequency for re reusing standard methods what you see here is um, is mass with the uh, passive samplers and one of our and a laser that we use um, that gives us very high frequency measurements and what we see based on the laser measurements we've never been able to see that kind of uh, temporal resolution of results is there's you know there's those what we knew about splash plate is that it creates um, a quick burst of uh, very high concentrations. Um, that comes through even, even clearer now um, with the laser measurements. We see how much larger um, those concentrations are comparing to uh, the low emission spreaders such as trailing shoe and injection. So it just shows you how critically important um, those first few hours and the first day of application is that's really where all the nitrogen is being lost. Okay. Um, at the plot scale, we're also looking at um, not only ammonia, so we're looking at not only ammonia, but also on the um, on other environmental um, uh, parameters and yields, for example. So looking at a number of slurry amendments here and comparing to protected urea and um, unfertilized control we looked at slurry with sulfuric acid biochar and gypsum or lactogypsum which is a, a slightly acidic uh, acidic soil improver um, there has been no statistical difference um, in yields over three harvests um, last year so it's a three cut silage system um, over two different soil types. So it kind of clearly shows that 
you know we need to be very very cautious about um about what we think or how much um how much maybe faith we have in a lot of uh, different slurry amendments okay so that's on the slurry side and just very quickly on the fertilizer side um you know with um what we know is not all fertilizers are the same there's a huge amount of difference there between emissions associated with can urea and protected urea so that's really where the protected urea message comes from um you know where you can lose approximately 15 percent of nitrogen uh, by spreading straight urea that goes down to just over three percent with protected urea so it's a huge difference um, but a word of caution is um, working previously in Johnstown, what we've seen is um, during the weather conducive to ammonia loss, unprotected straight urea can have loss of nitrogen of over 40%. So, you know, for every 100 euro of nitrogen spread, that's over 40 euro gone without any impact on yield. Um, whereas protected urea is here at the bottom. Um, and it can uh, substantially reduce um, losses there. Um, and the one thing about it is, you know, it's not only about um, the different uh, forms of fertilizer, but also in general, um, you know, with the farm to fork strategy, Ireland has basically committed to reduce fertilizer, um, fertilizer rates by 20%. And with the soaring fertilizer prices, everyone is looking at alternative solutions. So really we need to be thinking about increasing our nitrogen use efficiency by using those low emission slurry spreading, liming, clover, mixed species swords. So everything that can bring us uh, closer to, um, you know, to, to reducing synthetic N. Um, and where I'll finish on is just on what I mentioned before is the marginal abatement cost curve for ammonia. And it basically brings all of the research that we've done in Chagas uh, here into one benchmark and exercise where it looks like uh, looks at all the different mitigation options. And each bar is a, is a separate mitigation option. The width of the bar shows how much mitigation we can get. The height of the bar is the cost of it. And really the take home message from here is if you look at that graph, what really stands out is the low emission slurry spreading, especially for bovines and protected urea. And those two alone can provide 80% of ammonia mitigation to bring us closer to compliance. Okay, so I'll finish on that. Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing. And apologies, I've gone a little bit over time. <laughs> okay. I think that was absolutely fascinating and uh, the, the reactions we're, we're getting are, are really appreciative of the uh, of, of the amount of information that you have imparted in the last uh, <laughs> 40 minutes. Uh, so I think it'll take people a, a while to take it all in. A lot of questions coming through and I'll maybe just start with one for, for Dahi uh, and just said thanks for a great talk. Uh, if the Irish NEC directive targets are reached and ammonia reduction uh, uh, are reached um, and uh, uh, we get to, to below the limits, will this be sufficient to achieve the ecological targets to protect sensitive ecosystems? Uh, and or will they need uh, to, to, or will there need to be more stringent uh, targets in certain areas? It'll certainly help, no, no doubt about that. But. Um... That's focusing on you know contribution to national emissions, whereas you need you will definitely need to have more localized uh, focus on contributions to specific sites. Um, so you may may maybe you know some sites may have if you're directly downwind or upwind of a sensitive site, you may need to have more restrictions potentially than a site which is not. But the um, I would say yeah, there will be there will need to be more focused um, uh, attempts to reduce contributions to sensitive sites beyond just the blanket approach to reducing the national ceiling, emissions below the national ceiling. And again, I suppose one of the questions is, uh, uh, relates to the impacts, and I suppose they're, they're specifically talking about the health impacts. Are they more noticeable in areas uh, on a more easterly where there's been more accumulated uh, um, ammonia emissions across the country than are observed in, in say, western uh, uh, towns and cities? We tried to look at this, but we don't, unfortunately, Ireland doesn't have the resolution of data required to make um, such assessments. So the short answer is we don't know. Okay, Parikh, if you want to take up some of the many questions that are coming in there. 
and, and they're coming in hot and fast. Um, and uh, obviously, you can put in your questions in the Q and A section. Um, Dominique, you finished up. You wrapped up there with a look on the the Mac curve. Uh, there's a question in here. Does the or have or do you reckon they will have the the high fertilizer prices will have any impact on the Mac curve? Um, obviously, people are putting more attention on their the use of less to make better value of nitrogen as it stands. So, will 2022 be the year that we'll see a difference from the from the get go? Um, I'd be look. It's kind of it's it's maybe a silver lining to a bad situation in terms of the high fertilizer prices, but then the the um difficulties with ammonia compliance and with greenhouse gases, water quality as well. So I think this is nearly a kind of a perfect storm situation where we will see, you know, we we all we are already seeing farmers really looking for alternative solutions, and the nitrogen when nitrogen is cheap, um. You know, there's nothing. There's nothing stopping anyone to to buy more and apply more, and it's maybe not that much appreciated. Now it's really coming to the fore that um, we need to try to work with less and get get the most out of it. So it's you know, it's really looking at those mitigation measures. So definitely, yeah. Yeah, cheap cheap nitrogen is definitely a thing of the past. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah, it, it, I I remember when it was cheap. That was you know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, has anaerobic digestion a role to play at, at regional level in order to reduce ammonia emissions? Obviously, with the price of fertilizer, mm-hmm. sorry, we'll be remaining on farms. Um, but if a percentage was diverted to uh, anaerobic digestion, would this help? So it, it's an interesting one because the question is what happens with the digestate after. So in the in the anaerobic digestion process, what happens with the slurry is the carbon gets taken out for biogas production, but the nitrogen not only remains. But a um, majority of nitrogen in slurry is in the organic form. But after the anaerobic, after the digestion process, it moves to more um, mineral. OK, so even up to 100 percent of that nitrogen in the digestate is a plant available. So on one hand, um, it is a very good source of fertilizer because that nitrogen is plant available. On the other hand, what means plant available is also ammonia loss available so where we have to be very careful is that material has to be spread using low emission slurry spreading okay okay um dahi one that came in for you was uh, and i see you're, you're answering some of these as well but if one as well asked, I, guess, <laughs> I guess everybody is thinking similar thing they may not get a chance to ask so how can deposited nitrogen acidify and um, isn't it alkaline Oh, yes, I I just answered that one. Um, So it is alkaline, of course. But what happens is it's the, and again, to point out, I'm not an expert on the acidification element because it's not a huge component in terms of the impacts. Now that, you know, acidification isn't, the acid rain isn't really an issue in Ireland anymore. Um, But the, uh, it's a hydrogen ions. So it's hydrogen ions in the soil causes soil soil acidification. So that's the the mode of how how it acidifies, even though it, it is itself alkaline. Okay. Do algum slimes have any useful purpose? Not that I could see. No. That was a pretty straight answer. All right. <laughs> Is there any separate research being done on the impacts on the aquatic component of natura sites? Or is the monitoring done in the water bodies as well as on the bogs themselves? Okay, well, so the way this works, um, the lakes, vast majority of lakes would be more heavily impacted by likes of runoff than they will be contributions from atmospheric deposition. Atmospheric deposition will play a role, but it's minor compared to what other source of nitrogen that they're receiving elsewhere. Um, however, upland lakes are more of an issue because upland lakes, you, what you have is, you know, agriculture is an issue up, or runoff is an issue up there. But what happens is you get particulate ammonium can be, tra- can be transported up to these upland lakes. So because it, trans- it, it travels, you know, great, greater distances, so it can go up the mountains, no problem, and then it's deposited in these lakes, which can which can potentially cause an issue. But they're being monitored, and there's they're going to be part of the actual national emission ceiling directive monitoring in Ireland, where the proposal is that they will monitor these sites um, semi continuously, semi continuously at least for 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 those impacts. Um, so uplands, yes, lo, lo, lowlands, an issue, but not as substantial as the other sources of nitrogen. Okay. Um, Dominica, the national herd hasn't really moved in the last 20 years if you look at all the animal numbers. So how come it's becoming a problem just now? I guess that's one question that's in. And just to add to that, you mentioned the use of scrapers um, and running them every hour versus every three hours. And uh, just people wondering, is there any comparison done between the reduction in ammonia emissions versus the intensive use of electricity? Okay, so on the herd side is um, while the numbers 
are relatively stable, it's the structure that changes, okay? And um, the excretion rates from dairy animals are much higher than from um, beef herd. So what happens with um, the number of beef animals falling and with the dairy animals increasing, um, they're kind of, you know, they're more, they're fed, they're usually fed higher end diet. They have high uh, end excretion rate. I can't remember off the top of my head now what it is. I used to remember. Um, you might not, you, you might be able to um, uh, to help me out here. Um, but it's the it's the structure of the the national herd that's you know that's uh, changing and that's causing basically more nitrogen being excreted uh, in the system. Uh, in terms of the scrapers. That's a good question, and I honestly don't know because you know that's that that's more so like for example electricity that would be outside my area of expertise. It's more of a kind of LCA I think methodology to look at you know the emissions associated with that energy generation. Understandable. Um, an expert in ammonia it doesn't need to be an expert in electricity as well. But here's one from an ammonia point of view: Why do slatted sheds emit more ammonia than a straw bedded shed? Um, I, th I think um, it comes down to what happens to excreta after, you know, they, they hit the floor and, uh, and how they hit the floor. So in the slatted shed, they kind of sit on the surface of the slats, whereas um, in the straw, they kind of get the inf infiltrate more easily. So what happens with ammonia emissions are usually associated with the surface. Um, so the larger the surface of excreting surf, the larger the surface of kind of the emitter, you know, be it the, a dung pad or or a slurry being spread on the surface, um, the more ammonia is emitted. So if that material infiltrates better and mixes in with the straw, that kind of um, you know that reduces those losses. So that's basically how the low emission slurry spreading works as well. So rather than you know broadcasting slurry, it's depositing either in bands, um, kind of on, in bands either on top of the grass or kind of you know parting the grass and going on the on the surface. So it's basically reducing that um, that that emitting surface and also improving infiltration. Okay, and um, you've mentioned obviously that uh, one of the major benefits of um, extending the grazing season is the reduction in ammonia. So, major of, majority of ammonia sources are due to housing of livestock and associated slurry storage. Extending the grazing season should help reduce ammonia by by reducing the requirement for housing. Agroforestry in Northern Ireland found to extend grazing by thirteen to seventeen weeks per year, as compared to the adjacent pasture control treatment. Trees also capture ammonia and can be used as screens around housing for ammonia capture. Has there been any work done on living barns, i.e. outwintering livestock? Uh, with agroforestry, um, I think we're kind of, we're very lacking in that area. Um, I know, you know, the colleagues in, in Northern Ireland uh, have that, that long-term work on agroforestry, which are, we are very jealous about. And we've been you know, for the last few years, putting in um, bids for funding for work like that. And it just hasn't materialized in terms of uh, agroforestry and, and its impacts in general on kind of on the farming system. Um, on the outwintering itself, um, there has been a little bit of work done. Um, Connor Dowling did that a few years ago. That's when I was literally, Connor was finishing his PhD when I was starting mine. So some of it is a little bit older older stuff and you know I suppose overwintering wouldn't really be he was working on overwintering pads um it's it, it's not really a popular solution in Ireland so there there is kind of limited research there on in that area and it's similar um type question I guess is is there anything being done around um planting trees in farmyards uh, obviously there's a lot of that taking place even with Glanby's sustainability move to plant mm -hmm. thousand trees I think it is um is it something that farmers should be looking at um look we've we've kind of started looking at it um and it's obviously a long-term research because you know um we're whenever you plant something it's it's waiting on a few years to to get any impact from those planted trees so it's kind of it's a long it's a long-term gain um but i would never say no to planting anything we know that you know that the um while we might not have the actual figures 
we know from international uh, work that you know this works in capture ammonia um, and for other benefits obviously now though he might go into more detail on on how kind of shelter belt belt like that would be most effective um but you know what's the is, is, there, any, is there any harm from you know from from, from planting more trees always good move yeah <laughs> yeah yeah I agree. More trees is always a good thing, but just to highlight that to function effectively as a shelter belt. I was talking to the guys that do the research on this, you know, last week, and they again highlighted that you you need at least a minimum depth of ten meters, um, so ten meters along that the the stretch of wherever you're trying to block the money getting to, to to start functioning as a an effective shelter belt, um, a minimum. So you say ten, twenty, or thirty meters would be would be, would be optimum. But the um, that's 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 quite a, quite a, a large lump of land to capture the ammonia downwind effectively. Yeah. But again, I'm all for planting trees wherever you can. Sticking with the the tree kind of thing, is is, is there any research being done? And I know you've answered this in, in the chat already, but just for everyone else watching, is there any research being done on the impact of ammonia and the link with fungal disease and ash dieback, cankers, etc.? Uh, there's been work done. I remember looking at a review paper a few years ago that very clearly stated ammonia does exacerbate impacts such as from fungal diseases, um, droughts, and uh, frost damage as well. But the I, I don't know of any connection specifically to likes of ash dieback or cankers. But broad broad spectrum, there it does exacerbate other impacts. In a straw bedded situation, Dominica, is the ammonia not eventually released when the final farmyard manure is taken out uh, of the shed and it's cleaned out and obviously spread on the land? Um, would be very notable, noticeable in cleaning out of poultry sheds when wood shavings are used. Just yeah. a, a comment based on that. Uh, you would obviously, that ammonia is going to move at the end when you when you land spread uh, farmyard manure but the farmyard manure is associated with much lower um uh, ammonia emission factor upon land spreading than slurry and that's um you know my understanding is primarily because uh, most of the nitrogen is in the organic form okay you're, you're more or less answering the next qu next question mm -hmm. then, because with that if a cover is put on a store a stored slurry and to stop emissions of ammonia, does the ammonia not just get released when the, the cover is removed? Maybe just explain that for people. Um, so, okay, the, there's a number of different ways that you can cover a slurry. Um, and obviously the, you know, the kind of nearly, the harder the cover, the better. So you can have flexible covers or you can have hard covers and the hard covers would, would stop pretty much, you know, 100% of ammonia, while the flexible covers might have, um, you know, varying uh, degrees of reduction depending on, um, on, on how much air movement there is. But at the very basic level, um, a cover uh, for slurry is slurry crust. OK, so as long as there is, you know, the, a crusted slurry will have lower emissions than, for example, uncrusted slurry. So it's not necessarily when you uncover the store that you'll automatically lose a huge amount of uh, ammonia. There will be um, there will be kind of a gaseous balance uh, above that, um, above the slurry surface and kind of inside the in, inside the closed store. What will happen is once you break down the crust and agitate um to you know to spread the slurry that will create a burst of ammonia and then again when you when you spread it out on the field so it look there's there's kind of certain there's certain things that will never be able to um maybe reduce emissions uh a hundred percent um but it's about that being mindful to know where we can mitigate the losses and trying to you know not focus on those areas. I mean, we should be, you know, we should be trying to reduce ammonia in, in all areas, but kind of being mindful in where we can we can create the biggest impact, um, yeah. and yeah. not kind of undo something good that we've done. That's kind of what I meant, maybe with the um, additives and you know how you you can then use or with the anaerobic digestion digestate that you need to spread them with low emission slurry spreading. With the base, and, and Sorry, Pat, go ahead. Yeah, there's a couple of questions in there around the amount of the acids that need to be uh, used per cubic meter to have the effect. And uh, then a, a, a related question on, on whether or not there's any observable impact on, on soil 
uh, when you use these products? Okay. So in terms of volume of acid, it, it depends on slurry. Um, so I wouldn't be able to tell you at the top of my head what the volume of acid is. Um, we needed to calculate it and then check it for uh, each slurry that we had. It depends on slurry dry matter and nutrient content because slurry has a few uh, buffering. It has a it has a really large buffering capacity. It has a few kind of mechanisms that buffers the pH. So in order to drop the pH, you need to break through that buffering capacity and each slurry will be different. Um, so, you know, we have two farms in Johnstown, a beef and dairy. And if I take those two slurries, they will be different. Um, so it's kind of it's amending to a given pH. And for example, in commercial acidification situations, be it in, in Denmark or other countries, what happens is there is a pH sensor um, you know, that measures the slurry pH and doses acid as needed. Um, so regarding the volumes, I, I wouldn't be, uh, I wouldn't know off the top of my head now because it, it is slurry specific. Um, on the impact on soil, um, we're actually, so that's what we're working on at the moment. So we don't, you know, I don't have any data to show for it yet. Um, I should at the end of this year. Um, from international work, what we know from colleagues from the UK is they haven't seen much kind of, the, you know, they haven't seen any deterioration in soil quality over that time. Um, so for slurry spreading, so acidification can happen at two stages, either in the tank um, or in the tanker while you, you know, when you, when you go out with a slurry tanker to spread. So, and depending on those two stages, you amend to a different pH. So you need a lower pH in the storage than you would, um, you know, for the, for the acidification in tanker. Um, what even the commercial companies say is if they were going down to the same level as in storage, that's a huge amount of acid they would need. Um, it wouldn't really work in the tanker. And then, yes, there would be maybe more um, of an issue with uh, dropping soil pH. But as it is, um, the pH of, the sl of acidified slurry that goes out uh, to be spread on land, it's somewhere between 6 and 6.5. So it's not, you know, it's not going to be to have a massive acidifying impact. Okay. Any final questions, Parag? We're nearly out of time. I say we'll go back to Dai for one, try to keep a bit of balance. <laughs> you showed pretty geographically the, the impacts um, on a, an image I had there when you showed up the video uh, and the mosses. How does this feed through to the species such as flies, worms, frogs and ecosystems um, as, as a whole? So just say that one, squeeze the question one more time. You showed pretty geographically the yeah. impact of ammonia on mosses and so on. How does this feed through to the species such as flies, worms, frogs and ecosystems as a whole? Okay, Let's so you're talking... I guess the question then is around secondary impacts, yeah. which again is it's an emerging field at the minute, which I've not looked into. I've I've been looking into source of getting funding to look at avenues like that, but it's really the the research is internationally. It's only getting to the point of following the, through the trophic chains and what impacts the um, say for example, you know if you, if you impact on a lichen that is eaten by another animal, say, for example, a carry slug. Carry slugs are big part of the diet are lichen. So if you're impacting the lichen that carry slug eats, you're impacting on the carry slug. Similarly, if you're impacting on header, which is another impact, then you um, typically you get stunted header when you're exposed, ex exposed to ammonia. Tall header is the internationally, that's a preference for um, hen harrier for their um, nesting sites. So you're affecting potentially the hen harrier's preference in nesting, um, nesting grounds. So there is potential impacts. They, they've not been quantified or, you know, the, the connections haven't been made sufficiently yet to say impacting this will cause an impact on a bird or on a species. But there, there, is, a, um, there is theoretically connections there. But as I said, it's, it's an emerging science that has a lot of work yet to be done on it. So we'll have a presentation on it this time next year. Darn right. <laughs> we'll talk about that. Nice simple question to wrap up, Pat. Thanks. <laughs> okay, listen, thank you very much. And, and this, there's been huge interest in, ter in terms of, of questions. We've only got around to, unfortunately, to a fraction of the questions that were asked, but hopefully they, 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 the answers you've given have been really insightful. And I think 
there, there is more in this topic at some point in, in, in the future. So uh, I, thank you very much to, to Dahi and, and Dominica for, for your presentations. They've been really excellent. Uh, next week, we have, I, I suppose, in, in some respects to follow on from this, we have nutrient tips uh, to save uh, money and reduce emissions. Uh, so we have uh, uh, um, Dr. Patrick Forrestal uh, talking about that. And as you're probably aware, he's done a lot of work on, on uh, protected urea. So that's going to be part of, of that story. And ammonia is going to be part of that story as well. Uh, I'd like to thank our production team, Yvonne Marr and Andy Boland. And hopefully we'll, we'll see you again uh, this time next week. So thanks to all. Bye.